Even one like me You carry sin and shame The guilt of every man The weight of all I've done Is nailed into your hands Oh, your love It's running through my veins I can't escape its strength In you my soul is safe You cover everything Oh, your love bled for me Oh, your blood in crimson streams Oh, your death is Your blood 
in crimson streams. Oh, your death is hell's to be a cross man to kill is my victory. Oh, a cross man to kill is my victory. But you have never 
souls one For you have never failed me, no Sing that chorus again, all together The promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence to the, the only one who can and that's our Lord and Savior who's rescued us every single day that we've we've wronged him we've wronged someone else he's there moving our mountains out of our way so we can fix that we can come back together as as followers as brothers and sisters and we can move forward and we can move these mountains so let's do that this morning
I made a really bad decision when the coronavirus hit. I finally broke down to my youngest daughter and my wife to getting a family pet. I know what you're thinking. I'm a terrible father for not allowing that through the years, but I've resisted it. And I thought, you know, four kids is enough. We don't need more excitement in our lives. But we did break down and Kara did a little research. She wanted a guinea pig, pretty safe animal, pretty easy animal, and she got one for her birthday. And uh, all was going pretty well. Um, there's a picture here that she got this one first. His name is Cosmo. He's really nice. He's friendly. He doesn't hurt people or bite people and he's pretty quiet and I actually got to like him a little bit but then they said well guinea pigs need to have a companion they cannot live alone of course they didn't tell me this when I agreed to get the one and my wife wanted one and she really liked him so she got this other one on the bottom and she named him Inky now the ladies do not agree with my analysis on this but in my opinion Cosmo is a good guinea pig and Inky is the spawn of Satan. He doesn't like people. He's a bully. He bullies this other one. He bites people. And the worst thing of all, he likes to pee on you. And so you could look at these two guinea pigs, bought at the same age in the same location, they about the same breed of animal, and say, how could one be so nice and the other one is so mean? And in my view, kind of a mistake. Now again, the ladies in my life will disagree with all of this and they'll be upset that I even talked about it. But sometimes in our lives, we may feel a bit like the second guinea pig. That is to say, we're a mistake. We may feel like a failure. We may feel like we are incomplete. Or we might start comparing ourselves to other people and feel like, you know, I'm not as good as, as the other guy or the other lady or the other mom. And this is very common. We do this all the time. And when we do it, we start to diminish ourselves. And especially as Christ followers, we ought not to do that. And I want to talk today in our second part of the power of thanks, a sort of Thanksgiving series to get our hearts and minds ready for the gratitude season, as all Christians should do to really think through our relationship with God to ourselves. This is a seldom talked about topic in the church. In my view, especially going back to my younger days of church, it was avoided. And to talk about a right relationship with yourself was to be selfish, was to be sort of narcissistic or self-absorbed or be part of the self-esteem movement. And I, I mean none of those things. Those are, of course, part of the flesh. Our vanity, our pride can easily come in. We can easily sway to loving ourselves too much like that. And, and, and of course, the Bible talks against that. But it also talks about loving ourselves in a different way, an appropriate way. And, and really what we mean when we say loving ourselves isn't really loving ourselves, but it's receiving the love of Jesus Christ. And here's the bottom line. Until you receive the love of Jesus Christ, you can never be made well. You will never be fully whole. And you will always walk around with these broken pieces that I want to talk a little bit about today that will hurt you, diminish you, and make your life incomplete. They'll cause you all kinds of fears and anxieties. And so what do we do about it? How can we not see ourselves like that second guinea pig as a mistake instead to start to receive the love of Christ, which of course heals us from the broken places that we have within us. So let's start with the theology behind this truth. And I want to walk through this just a little bit. We don't have time to look at all the places in the Bible. Obviously, it would take us a week. But some of the key places, and one of them is this place in Matthew 22. And in, in this place of the Bible, pretty familiar to Christians, a religious leader, a Pharisee, comes up to Jesus and asks him a very simple question basically says, what is the greatest commandment? And in the Bible, they have many commandments, especially they're talking about the Old Testament, the law, the Ten Commandments, and of all those commandments of God. Of course, Pharisees came and added extra commandments that weren't even in the Bible. And he wanted a bottom line. He, he wanted to know Jesus' take on 
those commandments. Could you boil this down for us? And Jesus does. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and most important command. And the second command is like the first, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you see the two great commands. And we know these as Christ followers. You've heard of these. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we always look at them as two commands, and it is two commands. But it's very interesting that Jesus adds these little two words here, or, or, or the ending phrase here, as you love yourself. It's very interesting that he didn't just say, love your neighbor the way you love God or the way God loves you. He, he doesn't say that. He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And many have pondered over that, and why did he say it that way? Now, the whole passage, of course, is framed in a particular type of love. It's the agape love of the Bible. The, you may know there are many Greek words for the word love, uh, as opposed to the English language, where we only have one, so this gets a little confusing. And in English, you say, hey, don't love yourself. That's narcissism, but that's a different Greek word than when he says, love yourself here with the agape love. Because agape love is always giving to others. Agape love is always sacrificial. Agape love is always flowing. That is to say, God loves us and we love him back. Just as it says, of course, in 1 John 4, 19, we love God because he first loved us. And that's the order of things. Love is not something we can manufacture out of our broken hearts. In fact, it can't be manufactured out of just nowhere. It always comes from God. It always originated, originates from God because God is love. And so it has to be this order. We have to allow God to love us first. We love him back. We reciprocate the love, but the love flows through us, especially through Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, dying for us, raising from the dead. We love him back because he first loved us. And then, back to the great commands, and only then will we have his love flow through us to love others. And that's when you become a compelling presence for Christ, little by little, more and more like Jesus. As we receive his love, it comes pouring through us, and, and we love on other people as we love ourselves. But this whole thing gets broken down when we don't receive the love of Jesus Christ. The whole thing comes to a standstill when we believe God to a point, we might even receive salvation. That is to say, we might even become Christians, but we don't fully allow his love to come into our lives. That's problematic. That's when we tend to have certain problems that we carry with us and maybe you're like that today. I know I have struggled in the past with this. Uh, I'm speaking from experience. Maybe you are currently struggling with receiving God's love. Maybe you want to have a relationship with God through Jesus, but you don't feel good enough. You don't feel like you deserve it. You feel so unworthy and so unlovely. And that, it, apart from Christ, is partially true, but you need to get to that point where you say, yes, but God loves me anyways. And I receive his grace, his unmerited favor. I want you to think about the story of the prodigal son for a moment. This is my favorite story in the Bible. Many of you probably would say the same. It's a great, great story that Jesus tells. And he tells it, of course, to set up who God is, the father in the story, clearly is God proper, and who we are. We are the prodigal son. The prodigal son has both kinds of love, the kind of love in the Bible that is not love at all, a lover of himself, only thinking about himself. He's prodigal after all. He wants his father's money. He wants the inheritance early, which is a huge slap in the face. He takes the money and runs. He goes as far away as he can. He spends it in wild living, in women, in booze, in partying, in fake friends, and all of these kinds of things. That's the fake kind of love. That's, that's the sort of narcissistic love. That's the love of yourself that is, is not agape. It's not what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 22 at all. And that love, of course, creates distance from the Father, breaks the relationship, and it causes all kind of havoc in his life. In fact, he gets to the very, very bottom of, 
of, of everything, and he's in a pigsty, literally, when he comes to his senses. Of course, that's divine too, the Holy Spirit getting a hold of us. Many of us have had that moment in our lives where God got our attention in a big way. I hope you have. And when God gets his attention, he realizes, I need to go back to my Father. I need to get my relationship right with my Father, just as all of us need to do, and we do that through Christ. But here's where the second kind of love comes in, the love of self in the agape way. He struggles there as well, because as he returns back to the Father, he takes this long journey. The, the story says that he starts to recite in his head the words he will say when he sees his Father. Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your child. Take me as your servant. And he repeats that over and over as he walks back. He's just thinking about how he has failed so miserably. He deserves nothing. Uh, he, he doesn't deserve to be taken in at all, but at least he can be taken in as a lowly, humble servant. He'll never be able to r receive sonship again. That's what he believes. Now, here's where we all struggle. Here's where and why Jesus said, you've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's a, a, a bit of self-flagellation, self beating and self-abuse that we do that we're very good at as humans and he's doing that all the way back to the father but when he gets to the father the father says no put a robe on him my son has come back he's lost but now he's found and let's celebrate and he hugs him and, and kisses him puts a ring on his finger and you see the love of God to the prodigal son are we wayward yes do we fall away from God yes are we broken apart from Christ yes and we repent of our sins and we come to our senses, we turn to Christ, we come back to him. But when we do, there's an act of the will to receive the love of God. And when we rebuke the love of God, when we stiff arm the love of God, we will not fully receive his healing. And that is a huge problem on planet Earth. Look at Psalm 139 with me. This is a psalm of King David, the man after God's own heart. What's great about David is he's so emotive. He, he's so vulnerable. He's so, he's so not afraid to, to, to put himself out there for us. Of course, led by the Spirit of God, he writes these hymns. And this is such a great psalm. You can read the whole psalm. Let me read a little bit of, for you, at, at, starting at verse 13. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. This is very telling about David's relationship with the father because David clearly has received his love David here sees himself as God sees himself and it doesn't just start with his good works and all his exploits and all his championships and all of his winning days and all the glory and David had quite a bit of glory all of his battles won all of his merits for God all of the good things he had the bad things too we know that but that's not what he's saying he's, no when I was a little pre-born baby in my mother's womb, that's when you loved me. Even before I had done anything great, good or bad, that's when you already had a plan for my life. Before I could be a good person or a bad person, you, you were having thoughts about me. In fact, it says your thoughts about me are precious and they cannot be numbered. Now, I want you to think about yourself. Do you believe that for you? Do you believe that God loved you in the womb like that even before you were born and he still does today, hasn't changed one bit? Do you believe that he not only knows everything about you, good and bad, sins, ugly things, deep recesses your heart, things that only he knows about you? He knows all your good things too. But he constantly cares about you. He is thinking about you all the time. You're always on his mind. That's what it says. The, the times that he thinks about you are precious and they cannot be numbered. Do you believe that? Because that takes faith 
to believe what God said is true. But when we don't believe it, we're denying the scripture. We're de denying the word of God. We're actually denying God. And we're denying his full healing power in our lives. And when we stiff arm God like that, we only hurt ourselves. And of course, we're hurting our relationship with him. And just as the two great commandments say, we start hurting our relationship with other people. And ultimately, we hurt our relationship even with ourselves. That's why Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourselves. There's three parts to the great command of God. And when I think about this love of the Father, I think about my own imperfect fathering. And I would ask you the question, do you realize how much a father loves his child? Some of you do because you're fathers yourself and mothers similarly love their children. Do you realize how much a father loves his child? Even an imperfect human father like myself, trying to do well, trying to be a good dad, but often falling short. But the love that God seats in your heart for your own child is beyond words. It, it's indescribable. It's a very unique kind of love. I remember when my first child was conceived and I was over the moon, as any dad would be. And I just, I couldn't think straight. I couldn't eat right. I couldn't talk about it without tearing up. We got the ultrasound. You know, back then you get these like really grainy ultrasounds. You can't really tell if it's a baby or like a mushroom or, or a lima bean or whatever. But they tell you it's a baby and you can see it's alive. You can see the heartbeat. And they told me it was a girl. And my wife and I we were so ecstatic. And I remember carrying this picture around in my wallet and showing everybody as if they cared. And I would say, it's a girl. And every time I say it's a girl, like, like tears would come in my eyes for no reason. I mean, you couldn't even talk about it without being emotional. And that, of course, didn't stop there. My daughter's now out of the house and married. And I, I still have trouble talking about her or thinking about her without tearing up. It's just what a father does. God puts that love in your heart as a father for your children. And all four of my children, I feel that way. And as we know, that's extremely imperfect. It's, it's broken. I had days where I was short-tempered or, or said things I wished I hadn't said or I didn't spend enough time with them and all kinds of ways that I fall short. But God never does. And when he says he loves you, it's different. It's the unlimited version of I love you. When he says he thinks about you all the time, it, it means it in a very literal way because his mind alone could possibly do that. When he says he's for you and, and he wants good things in your life, he can back it up because he's all powerful he, and he never sleeps, he never slumbers, he, he never fails, he, he never lets us down. This is the God who is our father when we become a Christian. And right now to pause, if you're someone just leaning into this online service and you've yet to receive Christ, today's the day. I think today's the day to pause the video and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Take my sins away. I believe that you died for me on the cross and I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. And then tell somebody about it. See what happens. But for those who are Christians, I'm talking about something that takes you deeper in your walk with Christ. It's a reception of the love of God. We have to receive his love. That's what the Bible teaches. And what it means is we believe that he loves us and we start to accept how he sees us and we start to see ourselves as he sees us, not in narcissistic, self-loving ways, but in holy ways that say, yes, I'm not a mistake. Yeah, yes, I, I, I fail, but I'm not a failure. Y yes, I have sins, but they're forgiven. They are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and to deny that is to deny God. That's so important for us to consider. Now, there are many side effects. I want to talk about a few of them for the person that does not fully embrace the love of God in their, li in their life. When we reject God's love, I know because I've done it in the past. I struggle with this from time to time in the present. And, and I believe most people do if they're, if, they're, if they're really honest with themselves. But it takes, it takes some vulnerability to admit this, uh, as I'm trying to show right now today. To admit that even though you're a Christian and you love God, you don't always know that he loves you and you don't ha have the right view of yourself that the Bible teaches. And when that happens, again, there are these side effects. I, th I think one of them is we have a what, what is sometimes called a scarcity mindset. 
instead of having the abundant life mindset that God has all provision, that he, he takes care of me, that everything I have will be given to me, that all the promises of the Bible are true, that I'm a full son, daughter of God, that he truly is my father and like the prodigal coming, coming home, that he's received me again to himself, not because of my good deeds or merits, but because of his. That creates in us tension. It creates in us a problem that says, I'm not enough, or even resources, I don't have enough, or when it comes to giving or being generous, eh, I'm very stingy. This is a scarcity mindset. It says, I do not believe God at his word that he really loves me. He'll always take care of me, that he loves me more than the sparrows, as, as Jesus said. In First John, I, I'm sorry, in John 1, 12, Jesus said this, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he, he gave the right to become children of God. Now notice two parts in this, not one. It says, to all who received him and to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So first of all, we are children of God. What, that's beloved. That, that's the one that God cares for and cherishes. Even in our sins, Jesus died for us. And the way we got there, though, is to believe in Jesus Christ. Of course, that's the first step. But it also says that we receive him. And those are two different words. We believe him. That's in our minds and in our hearts. And we receive him. That means we receive the truth of Jesus. We receive his love. We receive his grace. You cannot stiff arm that grace without ending up with a scarcity mindset that says, I don't have enough and I'm not enough. No more... Uh, Nowhere did we see the scarcity, scarcity mindset than in the great toilet paper famine of 2020. Now, I'm not even kidding. We, we were scrambling for toilet paper. Everybody was trying to buy it up in bulk. We were buying it online. You could get like a roll of toilet paper at one point, one little roll for $4 on eBay. Uh, um, it was ridiculous because we all know COVID-19 is a respiratory virus. It has nothing to do with toilet paper whatsoever. <laughs> But as humans, we're exposed, weren't we? No pun intended. We were exposed with the scarcity mindset that we have. What if I don't have enough? What if I run out of these supplies? What if I don't have disinfectant wipes? What if I don't have toilet paper? Well, we still have problems finding some of these things. I couldn't buy napkins for months. Napkins. Like, what? We have this scarcity mindset that says we're going to run out apart from receiving our sonship, our daughtership of God on high that we are truly royal kids that don't have to worry about a thing. Uh, another side effect that I've noticed with denying God's love for me and not believing that, he, that I am who he says I am is we try to fill our lives with other things. We all know there's a God-shaped hole in all people. That's true. But when Christ comes in, he fills it. But when we don't fully receive his love, we sort of straddle a fence of this void. And we still allow the brokenness to, to take hold in our lives. A and Jesus says, I want to come and heal that. I want to give you abundant life. I want to give you life to the full. That's what Jesus promises in John 10. But instead, we don't really believe God loves us like that. And we're, we're too bound up with our, and it really, it's a form of reverse pride that I, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm smarter than God. I'm, I'm not going to take him at his word. I'm going to deny what he says is true. And so I start to look for other things. Let me give you some examples I think are very common today. Online shopping. I like to online shop. So does the whole world now. We've really moved to an online shopping world. And some of that, of course, is very practical and helpful. But it's also something I think that fills up a void for a lot of people. There's a little thrill when I click buy now on my phone for a new shirt or a, a, a new piece of furniture or whatever it is that maybe I needed, maybe I didn't. Um, I saw a stat this week that uh, e-commerce sales are expected to hit $4.2 trillion by the end of 2020. That We've never heard of that number. That's a number that's just astronomical. And this during a pandemic and during a difficult economic time, we were spending more money than ever before. And most of it's online. Is that wrong? Not, not all of it, but I, I would check your own heart on this. Have I resorted to online shopping as a way to fill the void rather than facing God and allowing him to heal me and receiving his love? Another way, of course, is entertainment. 
I don't know that we've ever had em entertainment the way we do today. Streaming video is the king. Everybody's online, practically. Uh, services to, to, to keep our minds occupied. Some of it, I think, is healthy and good. It, it, it can be fun with your family and so on. But uh, we've now got to the point where we are streaming so much. I read this this week that Internet service providers can no longer keep up with the bandwidth. In fact, they're they're begging companies like Netflix to to shorten their resolution to, to because that so many people, especially during COVID, are just binge watching show after show after show, and that's global. That's not just here. Why? Uh, we're trying to fill a void. We're we're trying to fill an emptiness. We're we're not satisfied with ourselves. We feel like failures. We feel like mistakes, and we we haven't believed God. We haven't received His love. And when we do that, we, we try to fill it up with entertainment. For others, it's sex. We know that's something that people look to, either in real life or online. And this is another way. It's a fake way to try to find fulfillment. Uh, alcohol or substance abuse is very common. In 2017 alone, 1 in 16 adults, 1 in 16 admitted to a substance abuse problem. Now, that's a serious problem. But I believe that it's probably over 50% of us maybe don't have a, a, a hardcore issue with drugs or alcohol, but have some kind of addiction. I, I, I would say it's probably a very high number because humans are good at self-medicating, trying to find that thing, whatever it is that we just do a little too much of, have take a little too much of. And why are we doing it? We're doing it because we haven't received God's love. We haven't allowed him to heal us. And so we try to heal ourselves with things that we don't need. Uh, and then uh, a fifth example, uh, our relationship with food. It can be excessive. It can be what we call stress eating or boredom eating, where you're eating not because you're hungry, but because there's something inside that you're trying to fill. I think food is a really common one for most of us. We just go to the chips or the ice cream or whatever, and we're, we're doing that um, in a way that, that becomes very unhealthy because we haven't received God's love to the full. This, this is where we are. And, and today would be the day for you to say, hey, yeah, I, I do that. And, and not in a self-condemning way, not in a self-critical way, just the opposite. Say, yes, I'm, I'm normal, I'm human. Let me, let me turn to my creator God to find the solution and, be, and to be healed. The third side effect is chronic guilt and shame. All of those things I just mentioned, and many more, sin problems, habits that we develop, problems in our life, failure, creates in us shame and guilt that never goes away. And yet, as a Christian, you might take it to the cross only to pick it right back up again. And so you live in this static state of feeling guilty, and it's always in the back of your mind, and it creates tremendous amounts of anxiety, creates anger, creates people who lash out at others, and road rage and everything else, creates all kinds of problems, this, this guilt and shame that we live on, even though Jesus said, take it to the cross and leave it there. We don't do that. We, we don't fully believe that he forgives us. And, and, and we, we tend to go to this last one, is that we become excessively harsh toward ourselves. Our self-talk is negative. We, we don't say, hey, I failed, let me take it to the cross. We say, I'm a failure, I'm a mistake. I'm such an idiot. I, I can't believe how terrible of a person is. Maybe I'm not even a Christian. Of course, a lot of those are from the voice of the devil, who in the Bible, his name means accuser. He, this his chief role is to accuse us before God and to ourselves. And we believe his lies. And when we do that, we become crippled. And we become ineffective in our witness. We, we, we're not compelling presence. We're, we don't shine our light for other people. We don't do good works because we're consumed with our own guiltiness and our own fears. This is a lot. I know. It's, it's a lot to take in. But all of this can be transformed. And all of this can be brought to the foot of Jesus Christ on the cross. All of this, this morning, can be healed. And I, I'm not promising an overnight or a quick healing. I think this may take time for many people. It could take years. But to begin that journey of, Lord, I need you to take these wounds that are inside of me and heal them up. And I, I need you to help me to receive your love because I'm struggling to do that. And just be honest with God today. I was born in a, a lower class family. And it was a good family. We were, you know, salt of the earth people, good people. But my parents struggled with many things. Some addiction, some alcohol problems. 
and at a young age, uh, their their lives started to unravel. They they had a lot of fights. They they eventually split up, and my dad left, and my brother left with him, and I I was with my mom for a few years. And as I shared in some of my own story in the past, those were difficult years for me. We went from lower class to dirt poor for a few years, just single mom, welfare. You know, one time in a, I remember being in a soup kitchen line, that this kind of existence. We moved to the inner city of Providence, which is a terrible place to live back then in the 80s. And I experienced violence and, and I felt very unsafe. I, I felt abandoned. Uh, I, I didn't feel like a whole person in those years. But at the same time, God had gotten a hold of my little heart. He had helped me to be saved. He, he had brought me over the line of faith at a young age to become a Christian, even though we weren't even really going to church back then. My mother had a faith, and she shared that with me. And, uh, and then, also at a young age, during some of the darkest time, he called me into ministry. He said, you're going to be a pastor. And I just accepted that in faith, and I determined to, to imperfectly follow that plan for my life. I knew that was his plan. And he carried me even through those dark times, but not without some damage. I felt wounded. And of course, you don't always know about that when you're a kid. You, you ruminate on that later. Um, I felt like it was very difficult to receive God's love. I, I felt like he loved me, but I was a failure. I was um, unworthy. I, I, I shouldn't be able to even be a pastor because of my background and who I was and the things that happened. And all of those wounds can come into our lives and blind us to the truth of who Jesus is and what he did and what he said. And that's what I would leave with you today is to examine that in a fresh new way today in prayer. Maybe take some time to reflect on this, some silence, some, some time in scripture, talking to some friends, some Christian friends about it, and just maybe ask God, Lord, have you fully healed me? Have I allowed you to fully heal me? Have I truly trusted in your grace? Do I really believe that you love me the way the psalmist said? Am I following the great commandments all the way through? Love God, love my neighbor as I love myself. Have I accepted the truth? Because until we do, we cannot have that healing. That's my prayer for you today, that you would have that healing. and You would know. I'm still a work in progress. I have a long way to go, but God has given me that. He's given me that sense of his, his pleasure, uh, his exhilaration uh, of who I am in Christ. Not because I'm so great, but because he makes me great. Not because I'm so special, because he makes us special. Not because I have a great gifts, but he, he just magnifies those gifts in a way that gives him all the glory. And he'll do that for you too. Let's pray together toward that end. Our precious Heavenly Father, we admit to you today that we fall short in so many ways. We do fail you. We are not perfect. We are sinners, saved by your grace, and we're at your mercy, Lord. We also admit that we don't easily receive your love. We buck up against it. Our flesh wants to earn our way to heaven as if we could, and when we don't receive it, we admit we do all kinds of other bad behavior to try to make up for it, and it gets worse. And so rather than getting healed, Lord, we get broken even more. We go our own path. I pray for the prodigal son or daughter who's listening into this online service right now. You know who it is. That they would come to their senses by the Holy Spirit and return to their Heavenly Father, and you would save them today. I pray for the one who has come back, but like so many, like me in the past, they're standing at the gate of the Father and they're unable to receive his love. They're still beating themselves up and saying, I can't go in and be part of this family. I've done too many bad things. I'm too much of a failure. I pray that you would break through in their heart and mind today. Let them know as King David knew that your, your thoughts toward them are precious and they cannot be counted. Your love for us is overwhelming. It makes no sense because we don't deserve it, but you offer it anyways. Overwhelm us with your love. Grow our church family as a compelling presence for Christ and begin this healing in our hearts. Bring it even further today, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, thank you for being with us again today. 
Can't wait to end our Thanksgiving series next week. We hope you join us for that third power of thanks. And invite someone to watch with you if you're still watching at home or share this video. Be sure to, to keep joining us uh, online. Uh, follow us on Facebook so you can see what's going on with our latest 516. Uh, and we can't wait to see you again.